I'll just stay down here. Yeah. Well, good morning, church family. It's good to see you this morning. We're going to start the service off this morning a little little differently. I've got Barb Bates up here with me, and she uh, helps lead our prayer ministry in the church. And uh, we just feel like it's important this morning that we spend time praying uh, for those who were affected by some of the uh, storms in Iowa uh, this past week. So I'm going to give the mic to Barb, and she'll, if you're not caught up, a few details, and then we'll spend just a few moments in prayer. Thank you. Um, Cedar Rapids was hit especially hard. Um, there's still no power in the city at all. There's only two gas stations open for 150,000 people. Um, we really need prayers for Cedar Rapids and most of Iowa. Um, over 10 million acres of cropland was totally destroyed or almost destroyed. There are people living that don't even have homes because the homes have been destroyed. So they're living under tarps because there's no tents. They can't find generators. Um, there's no food. They're really hurting. They, they need prayers desperately, most of Iowa, but Cedar Rapids was hit, was hit especially hard. And I have family down there that, um, like I say, there is no power, there's nothing. Um, they're using hand saws to cut trees off of houses because they can't even always get gas for chainsaws. So I just would really like prayers for most of Iowa, but especially Cedar Rapids. Thank you. Mm, thanks. Let's pray at this time. Lord, this is one of those situations that um, I, I don't know that I have the words, um, but you tell us in your word that uh, you know what we need before we even ask. We know that you are a perfect provider. You're our heavenly father who loves us, who sent your one and only son to die on the cross and be raised from death in our place so that we could be reconciled to you, so that we could know you. And right now, many of your children are hurting. And there are neighbors, part of your church. And Lord, we ask that you would not only stir our hearts and encourage us to, uh, to do something, whether that's prayer or, or giving or, or making a trip to go and help, whatever the case may be, Lord, that we would be responsive to what it is that you're asking us to do. Lord, we ask that the needs of these individuals would be met. And that you would help us comfort others in the same way that you've comforted us. We thank you, Lord, for this time to worship today because we're reminded about your truths and your promises and we stand firm on those truths. I thank you for the families that are present here today. We want to continue to pray for all these families that have been affected by this storm. In Jesus' name, amen. Why did you stand with us as we worship today?
God we serve. Heavenly God, we want to thank you that you are mighty, Lord God, to save our hearts, our souls, and everything that we are. That you are great, Lord God, and that your grace abounds, Lord, is greater than anything else, Lord God, that we come across in our life. So we thank you and we want to praise you from the bottom of our hearts. In Jesus' name.
All right, I need to hear an oh yeah from all the kids who are excited about VBS tonight. <laughs> all right, well, VBS does kick off tonight. You can still sign your kids up, your grandchildren up. And, uh, you know, we usually do this at the end, and we're going to do that as well. But how about we just show some OCC appreciation to Shannon and his team who put together all the decorations this year. I think there were a few of our OCC members that were here more than I was here this week. So awesome job, guys. And we're looking forward to a great week. Well, I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. Uh, we're going to look at verses 1 through 7, and then later we're going to jump to 1 Timothy 3. And while you're doing that, I want to take just a moment and welcome any of our guests who are watching in online. Uh, feel free to write in the comment section, let us know who you are, and uh, welcome any guests that are here today. Um, you can fill out that Connect card that's in the back of your seat and uh, really help us get to know you that way. 
Well, Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1, Dr. Luke wrote these words. As the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their words were being, their, their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 called a meeting of all the believers, and they said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea, and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, who was an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them and laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. So once the church was established back in Acts chapter 2, it didn't take long for the early church leaders to become overextended, too distracted and ineffective with their primary ministry responsibilities. And then you jump to Acts chapter 6 and we read about how these apostles, they started taking on too much responsibility for ministry to happen effectively. See, there were a lot of physical needs in the church at the time. There continues to be physical needs in the church today as well. And because there weren't enough people who had been equipped to meet these needs, uh, different groups started to feel neglected. These early apostles, they were more than willing to do the work that needed to be done, uh, to care for those who were hurting physically. But they weren't very skilled or proficient at it. These men were also torn between meeting the physical needs of others and fulfilling their pastoral duties, specifically praying for the church and teaching the word of God. So they decided to call a meeting with all the believers, and it was decided that the apostles would appoint pastoral assistants who would oversee the food program and ministry to widows, giving the apostles the opportunity to focus on the role that God had given them, praying for the church, and teaching the word of God. This passage in Acts chapter six is a description about what these early believers chose to do about a specific situation. It's a description, but it's not prescriptive, meaning it doesn't tell us exactly what we should do. This passage also doesn't mention the role of deacons in the way God's word addresses deacons later on in the New Testament. We're going to talk about deacons today. A lot of commentators and historians believe that the position and role of deacon in the church started all the way back in Acts chapter 6 by the apostles in Jerusalem. Now, whether that's the case or not, it doesn't tell us that definitively. Um, From this section of scripture, we can see the biblical principle that still stands today, that when the spiritual leadership in the church becomes overextended, to the point where they don't have time for prayer, teaching the word of God, and caring for the spiritual needs of others. There should be individuals, other people who are equipped and appointed to help alleviate some of the load, doing the work of the ministry. And friends, this is the pattern that we see throughout the rest of the New Testament. We're in week three of our series, Biblical Church Leadership. Today, we're going to talk about the role of deacons in the church. Now, I would say that if you missed last week's message on elders, you need to find an opportunity to listen to that because it really does lead in to this message. We looked at Acts or uh, 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7 last week, and today we're going to pick up right where we left off. Now, I'll say this, that in the New Testament, um, we actually do have a few examples of local congregations that didn't have deacons, but we never see a local church without elders. And the pattern that we see is that elders were always appointed first, and then when there was too much ministry to go around, they would equip pastoral assistants called deacons who would help with the work of the ministry in the church. 
Elders and deacons are mentioned together on two different occasions in the New Testament. And that's because these two groups of leaders are meant to work closely together. In his book on church leadership, a pastor and author Mark Driscoll, um, he has this to say. I really like this. He said, practically, elders and deacons work together like left and right hands. With elders specializing in leading by their words and deacons specializing in leading by their works. So elders specialize in leading by their words. Deacons specialize in leading by their works. Now, whenever we hear the words elder and deacon, I I do believe there's a tendency in the church for people to think that one is better than the other. Some people have the assumption that if you, know, you just work really hard as a deacon, then, then one day maybe you'll get promoted to the role of elder. And I think our culture influences our thinking in this because, uh, friends, this, this way of thinking couldn't be further from the truth. I like to think of these roles like a marriage. You see, within the covenant relationship of marriage, both the husband and the wife are equal in the eyes of God. But they're different. They've each been given different roles. So elders and deacons are equal but different. They have different roles. Elders specialize in leading with their words, and deacons specialize in leading with their works. Now, I want to say this. Just I, I debated whether or not to put this in the message or not this week, and uh, time will tell if I was right by adding it. <laughs> but uh, I think because of the season that we're in, uh, this being an election year and, and everything else going on, I was reminded of this truth this week, that the role of elder and deacon in the church was also never meant to imitate local and national government. I'm acting as a system of checks and balances. That's That's not the picture that we see in the New Testament. Again, I fear that some people believe that our elders should be there and they are the spiritual leaders of the church, but that we need deacons who can keep the elders in check just in case they're wrong in the direction they're trying to lead the church. This is not the model that we see in the New Testament. And and this isn't the purpose of elders and deacons in the church. At that point, we've gotten so far away from what God's word actually tells us. Elders and deacons are meant to work together. One primarily leading with their words, the other with their works. Just like last week, we're going to look at three important questions uh, in this message. Um, Two of these questions are identical to the message last week. And then our third question you'll see in your bulletin is one that I think we need to spend a little time on today. Again, if you missed the message on elders, I want to encourage you to go back because um, these roles are different. And it's important that we understand uh, Jesus' call and and the role for these uh, positions in the church. Question number one that we're going to look at, uh, what is a deacon? We've already said that elders and deacons are meant to work together. But when we go back and we look at the Greek word for deacon, it's the word diakonos. Our English word deacon comes from this Greek word diakonos. This word means servant or one who serves. Servant or one who serves. So deacons are the servants of the church who lead and do the work of the ministry in the church. And what's amazing is that the list of qualifications and characteristics for the role of deacon in 1 Timothy 3 that we're going to read about is nearly identical to that of the elder minus teaching and preaching ability. They're nearly identical. And really, friends, this shouldn't come as a surprise to any of us because the list of qualifications and characteristics for both elders and deacons should also be the characteristics of all those who truly walk with Christ. This isn't a list that's just set aside just for this role. Sure, it does define that. It gives us the the qualifications and characteristics, but these should be characteristics of of every true believer. As we grow in maturity in Christ, we learn to to bring others along with us. These should be qualities of of all believers as well. So what is a deacon? Uh, Diacono, servant, one who serves in the church. Question number two, what qualifies someone to serve as a deacon? We're going to spend most of our time here this morning. Um, Last week, we looked at the qualifications for elders in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, and today we're going to pick up right where we left off. Um, I'd like to read the passage in context, and then we'll look at these qualifications, qualities, and characteristics individually this morning. So if you have your Bible with you or your smartphone, uh, we'll look at 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. You're going to see a transitional phrase here, again, because it comes directly after what we looked at last week. 
Paul says, in the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, so here's another transitional phrase, in the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and a great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. So we see here the, the list of qualifications, qualities, and characteristics for someone who's called to serve and who does serve as a deacon in the church. Um, this morning, I want to give you seven words that all begin with the letter S that summarize this list for someone serving as a deacon. I think these words, because it's just a single word, they'll help us, remem- they'll help us memorize and, and remember um, the characteristics, the qualifications for deacons. So number one, a deacon is to be serious. A deacon is to be serious. Now, I know I'm going to mess this up at some point because my wife is sitting here. When I told her uh, that last week I was going to be talking about the role of elders and this week I was going to be talking about the role of deacons, um, she just responded to me and kind of repeated back to me that, hey, what are you going to talk about with elders and what are you going to talk about with deacons? That's the word that she says. I don't know if you caught on to that. (laughs) Deacons, not deacons. So she called them deacons, and I'm probably going to say that at some point this morning. But a deacon, not deacon, is to be serious. Serious. So in verse 8, the qualification uh, that deacons are to be worthy of respect. That phrase, worthy of respect, is best translated as grave uh, or reverent. Reverent is the most accurate word there. Um, So you could read it, deacons are to be reverent. You know, when someone serves in any role in the church, whether they're a deacon, an elder, or just serving in the church, a children's ministry, our welcome team, our worship team, our fellowship ministry, whatever it is, there should always be a sense of reverence when going about the task. That's because every single task, every single job in the church is important. Every single job is important. Uh, Pastor and author Alistair Begg likes to say, uh, there are no menial tasks in the kingdom of God. He's saying there are no unimportant tasks, unimportant jobs. Every job is important. Every task is important. See, this requirement that deacons are to be worthy of respect or reverent is just a reminder that this is also a characteristic of any Christian who's serving in the church. We see that reminder from the Apostle Paul in Colossians 3, 23 and 24. It says, whatever you do, he he doesn't say only if you're doing this job or this job. He's saying whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Friends, here at OCC, we believe that every job is important. Every job is important. In fact, on the count of three, I want us to say that together this morning, that every job is important. One, two, three. Every job is important. I think we can do better than that. I think we can do better. One, two, three. Every job is important. If we can't even say it, we're not going to believe it and we're not going to live it. We have to believe that because scripture tells us that. Every single job is important. You know, anytime you have the opportunity to serve, regardless of what it is, I want to encourage you to do so with all your heart because you're serving the Lord. You're not serving so that others would look at you and recognize you and so that you'd get the credit for it. You're serving the Lord. And he's gifted you and positioned you to do that. You know, from our paid staff Uh, to our amazing volunteers in the church. We have a lot of fun working and serving together as a church family. The camaraderie in our church is awesome and it's only growing. But we're also serious about our mission. And we understand that it is a privilege to serve God with the gifts that he has given us. Deacons are to be serious about the role that God has given them. They're to be reverent. 
Number two, a deacon is to be sincere. A deacon is to be sincere. So not only are deacons to be serious in how they serve in their role, but they should also be sincere. Now this word um, really refers to consistency. You could read it, deacons should be consistent, and they should be consistent in how they interact with people, both inside the church, outside the church, and how they serve in the church. What, what, what does that mean? Well, I believe a deacon should be the same person in the workplace, in their family, in their circle of friends as they are serving in their role in the church. They're consistent. You know, our lives, uh, friends, were never meant to be broken up into different compartments, like the different rooms in a house. All right, but last night, my wife made fajitas, and they were amazing. All right, they were awesome. We made those in the kitchen. We ate in the kitchen. That's what you do in the kitchen. All right, if we want to watch a movie, we go to the living room or play a board game. If I need to take a shower or brush my teeth, I go to the bathroom. All right, we have different rooms for different things. And I, I think we try to compartmentalize our lives like that sometimes. It's like we've got our church life and our church friends, and then we've got work. Then we've got these people that I know I probably shouldn't be spending time with because they discourage me in my walk with Christ. All right? We've got all these different compartments. But no, we're to be consistent. In Christ, God should have access to and lead every single part of our lives. And deacons should lead by example, living out a sincere faith in Jesus, both in the church and in the community. They say what they mean, and they mean what they say. Deacons should be consistent. They should be sincere in their faith. Number three, a deacon is to be sober. A deacon is to be sober. One of the qualifications and characteristics of a deacon is not indulging in much wine. Now, the literal translation here is not too much wine or being addicted to wine, being addicted to alcohol. In other words, deacons shouldn't be over fond of alcohol. Their minds should not be occupied by it, and they shouldn't devote their time to it. Instead, they should be Ephesians 5, 18 kinds of people. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Ephesians 5, 18. He says, don't be drunk with wine. Why is that? Well, Paul says, because that will ruin your life. And then he says, instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we know that God's word does not prohibit drinking for the Christian. All right, we've talked about that in depth in our series on the book of Galatians. You can go back and listen to those messages from last year if you'd like. Um, but scripture does prohibit getting drunk. Anyone serving in leadership, serving as a deacon, as an elder, a ministry team leader, whatever it is, should strongly consider Paul's words here. You see, Paul is associating being drunk with the life of an individual who's outside of Christ. He's putting the two side by side. And that's because when you live a life that's overly fond of alcohol, you, you're, you're getting drunk all the time, you're making decisions and, and living out of the desires of your flesh and not by the leading of the Holy Spirit. I think this is important for us today. Um, because I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this. This is only the second time I've really brought something like this up in a message. But I'll hear something like this, and it never ceases to amaze me, um, the debates that we get into with ourselves. And, and this is the debate. Well, how much alcohol is okay, and how much is not okay? It's like we want there to be a guardrail just so we don't go over the edge, and we want it to be as close to the edge as possible. <laughs> we just want to know how much is okay, what we can actually do. Right? And this is what came to my mind this week. Instead of debating about how much alcohol is okay or not okay, we should be far more concerned about how much the Holy Spirit has of us. That's what we should be concerned about. I've actually heard stories about aspiring elders and aspiring deacons who decided to give up drinking altogether because they didn't want anything to come between their relationship with God. They didn't want anything to stand um, as a roadblock as for their witness to other people. They saw that as, as potentially being something that could, could be a roadblock. And they said, you know what? If God's calling me to serve in this position, I'm gonna remove any and everything I can to be faithful. So a deacon is to be sober. Number four, a deacon is to be satisfied. 
A deacon is to be satisfied. Um, Verse 8 ends by saying that deacons should not pursue dishonest gain. They should not pursue dishonest gain. What does this mean? It means they're content. A deacon is to be content. They live generously instead of living to accumulate more. Now, the reason I chose the word satisfied is because later on in 1 Timothy chapter 6, so just a few chapters later, um, when Paul addresses the entire church on how the love of money is a root for all kinds of evil, um, he makes the point to the church that the antidote to the love of money is contentment. That's the antidote. And we know that contentment is found when we believe and stand firm on the promise that our Heavenly Father is our perfect provider, that He will always meet the needs of His people, that our contentment is found in Christ and His Word and not in the world. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. This is a wonderful verse. I think you could almost read this backwards. He's saying great gain, great wealth is found when our contentment is in Christ. That's what true wealth is. That's what true gain in this life is. You see, if deacons are overseeing budgets in the church, and many of them do, if they're dealing with money, if a deacon is leading a ministry that's focused on meeting the physical needs of others, and at the same time, they're not content in their own lives, they live only to accumulate more then that discontentment will eventually make its way into the church, and friends, it will affect the mission and the ministry that God has given us. A deacon is to be satisfied. They're to be content in Christ. This is an important biblical truth. It really is a principle for all believers. It's, it's, a, it's the key to spiritual growth. You see, when we love God and we center our lives on him, we can be content with what he's already given us and what what he will give us and what he's doing in our lives. But the key there is to love God and to center your lives on him. So deacons are to be satisfied in Christ, not pursuing dishonest gain, and they're to lead by example as they model contentment in Christ. Others should be able to look at their lives and have a biblical picture of, of contentment lived out in the life of someone who loves Jesus, loves the church, and cares about our mission and ministry. Number five, a deacon is to be spiritual. A deacon is to be spiritual. This point kind of threw me, it's like a curveball. It threw me a curveball for sure. Uh, Verse nine says, they must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. So we know that, that elders and deacons, they're equal in God's eyes, but they have different roles, all right? They, they serve a different purpose in the church. So if that's the case, and if elders are the spiritual leaders of the church, key word spiritual, then why is this verse here for deacons? That they must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. I believe Paul's reminding us that it's wrong for us to think that the service ministries in the church are to be done by people who are only good at painting walls or cleaning things up. You see, in the same way that there are no menial tasks in the kingdom of God, meaning that every job is important, there are no menial tasks. There are also no unspiritual tasks in the kingdom of God. Amen? Every job is important in the church, and every job is spiritual because we're serving the Lord. There are no menial tasks in the kingdom. There are no unspiritual tasks in the kingdom. Regardless of what it is that you're doing, it has a purpose. It has value because you're serving the Lord. You see, church, the way in which we do everything that we do as a church will convey what our foundation really is and what matters to us. Deacons are to be individuals who hold the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience, and they live these truths out through their acts of service in everyday life. They're to be individuals who've been changed and are being changed by the gospel, who understand the deep truths of the faith and hold true to these truths with a clear conscience. This really hit me like a ton of bricks this week. Again, it was a curveball at first, and then I realized, you know, deacons are individuals who are serving in ministries, leading ministries, 
where they have the opportunity to share Jesus with others who need Jesus, whether that's in the church or in the community. As they serve, they're interacting with people who need the Lord. So they should be able to explain the gospel as they serve. They should be able to explain to others what Jesus has done in and through their lives, what he's doing, and what Jesus accomplished on the cross. They should be able to explain the gospel to others. Um, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 tells us, um, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. All right, so all of a sudden, this isn't just for deacons. This is for every believer. We should be ready to tell others about Jesus, about our hope in Christ. You know, for me, I think a great way to gauge um, how I've served Jesus throughout the past year, if I've been obedient, if I've done the things that God wants me to do, I like to ask myself the question, you know, how many people have I shared my story with this year? How many people have I, have I told about Jesus? And not just from this platform, but in everyday life. If someone asks about your hope as a believer, you should always be ready to explain it. Again, this verse is for all believers, but especially especially leadership in the church. So although elders are the spiritual leaders in the church, they primarily lead with their words, the spiritual demand in both lists of qualifications is exactly the same. It's exactly the same. Deacons are to be spiritual. They love the Lord. They love the word of God. They love people. They're eager to tell people about who Jesus is and what he's done in their life. Number six, a deacon is to be selected. A deacon is to be selected. Um, this is an important one, and I want to hang on this just for a minute or two. Um, verse 10 says, uh, they must first be tested. So a deacon, an aspiring deacon, must first be tested. And then if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. All right, so we have this verse. Now I want us to think back to Acts chapter 6, all right, where the word deacon isn't used, but a lot of people, and I, I would fall in this category, believe this is really the first time that we see the role of deacon in the church. All right, we look back to Acts 6. The individuals who were chosen to oversee the mercy ministries in the church were individuals who were selected. They were selected. They, they weren't random people that the apostles just pulled off the street. It wasn't a popularity contest or, hey, you've been going to church this X amount of years. You know, it's two years longer than this person. You should serve as a deacon. No, they were selected. They were chosen based on specific characteristics and qualities and qualifications. They were chosen based on what others knew about them. They were chosen based on their character, their relationship with God and with others. They were selected. See, Paul is saying it's, it's only after a season of testing, making sure that an individual is above reproach, that uh, he or she meets these qualifications, that they're given the opportunity to serve as a deacon in the church. This is one area where I believe we could grow as a church. We need to give people the opportunity to go through a season of testing before we decide whether or not they're fit to serve as a deacon. I'm just going to assume, because I know I've done this myself, you go an entire year without really thinking about someone uh, that you could be equipping or investing in and, and uh, really building up to serve in this role. And then we get to the end of the year, and as a church family, we pass out these pieces of papers, and we either say yes or no, and, and that's all she wrote. <laughs> we vote people in to be deacons, and we haven't given them the proper time to be tested or equipped. It really does turn into a popularity contest. That's not biblical. We need to spend the time that it takes to properly test and equip individuals for this role, giving them an opportunity to serve in the church and grow as a believer. Finally, number seven, a deacon is to be settled. A deacon is to be settled. Verse 12 says, a deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. As with the elders of the church, deacons are to be individuals uh, you know, who manage their homes well loving and caring for their spouse and their children in the same way that Christ loves and cares for the church. I'll say this, that if a deacon's home life is in shambles, right, if there are broken relationships and that's gone on for seasons, if things are a mess with their children that are living under their roof and under their authority, my opinion 
is that there might need to be a season where they step away from serving as a deacon for a short time so that more attention can be given to the family. You see, church, we're never called to serve the church at the expense of our family. I think that's important for us to hear. I've known so many people who are faithful servants in the church. But when you get to know them, you go a little deeper, you realize it's been at the expense of their family. It happens all the time on the pastoral level, leadership in the church, but it also happens with church members. We almost use our service in the church as an opportunity to not invest in our families. It's like we help build the organization, we help build the church, but we don't build our families. Family should come first. The deacon's home life will never be perfect, and that's not what Paul is asking for here. That's not what God expects. But Christ does need to be at the center of the family. Life outside the church must be put together. It must be settled before an individual is able to lead in the church. A deacon is to be settled. Question number three. I think this is the big question that um, everybody wanted an answer to, and I'm going to try to do that today. Again, if you haven't listened to this, the message on elders, um, the two roles are very different. The qualifications, even to an extent, are different. So I want to encourage you to go listen to that. But question number three, as it relates directly to deacons, uh, can a woman serve as a deacon? Uh, friends, this is a question that tends to cause quite a bit of division in the church, uh, but it really shouldn't. And here's why, because this is not a salvation-defining issue. This is an open-handed issue, a second- or third-tier issue. It's not a salvation-defining issue. And this morning, what I want to do is I want to answer this question in three parts. First, I'm going to read the one verse that I skipped over in 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. You'll notice I skipped over verse 11, and I did that on purpose. Um, Then... I'm going to share three common interpretations of this verse. And I would say that if you hold any one of these interpretations, any one of these beliefs, um, you can worship at OCC. Uh, You can be a member at OCC. um, As long as you're not divisive as a member of the church. And then finally, I want to give you my own opinion, which um, is not worth much. (laughs) I've been wrong many times, and I'll be wrong many times again. And I'll share where we're at as a church in praying about this issue. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11. Paul says, in the same way, so you see that's a transitional phrase there, uh, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. So most of the debate about this question centers around this one verse. And I'll admit that the Apostle Paul's language here can be confusing. So there's three common interpretations which are as followed. Number one, That Paul, when he says this, is referring to the women who assist the deacons in the church. So you have male deacons who are the servants in the church, and then you have women who are just assisting in those roles, helping accomplish the the work of the ministry. That's one view. Another interpretation is that Paul is referring to the women who are the wives of male deacons. Some of your translations will actually say wives there. And I would argue that's not the most accurate translation to the Greek. I would also say that a major problem with this interpretation is this. uh, There's not a similar requirement for the wives of elders. I think about this for a second. And this would mean that the deacons have a higher standard to meet than that of the elders, who hold the highest human position of authority in the church as spiritual leaders of the church. So in my opinion, this interpretation can't stand on its own. And then number three, that Paul is referring to the women who serve as deacons. That there are and should be women in the church who serve in these roles. So depending on the translation that you're reading, you'll usually see language that already suggests one of these three interpretations. And there's likely going to be a footnote at the bottom of the page explaining the other options, especially if you're reading a study Bible. So what's my opinion? Well, this is what I believe, is that this verse can and does mean all three. It can and does mean all three. I believe that the Bible teaches that a woman can and should serve as deacon if she's called and qualified. 
that some female deacons are married to male deacons, and that some female deacons will be assisting other deacons in the church. I believe it can and does mean all three. Why is that? Well, this is why. I'm glad you asked. If understood in this way, then this entire text flows really nicely. Verses 8 through 13. So the qualifications that we see in verses 8 through 10 are for both male and female deacons. And then you get to verse 11, and that gives additional qualifications for female deacons only. And then you get to verses 12 and 13, and that gives additional qualifications for male deacons only. Now, it's not just this text that we have. What's one of the best ways that we can interpret God's word? We should interpret scripture with scripture. All right, it shouldn't just be an opinion. A lot of times it might come to that. And we want to be accurate to God's word, but we should interpret scripture with scripture. So we have evidence throughout the New Testament for female deacons in the church. At Romans 16, verse 1, I don't know why this verse gets written off because it uses the exact same word, diakonos, that we see in 1 Timothy. It says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a deacon in the church in Sencrea. Again, that word deacon is diakonos. It's servant or one who serves. There are other women mentioned in Romans 16, like Mary, Tryphena, Tryphosa, all of these women whom Paul honors and thanks for their service in the church. He doesn't call them deacons, but most theologians and commentators believe that if that's the position that you hold, that's the role that they would have served. And then you jump over to Philippians 4 and you have Eodia and Syntyche, two women that Paul does the same. So where are we at as a church with this? We're going to be praying about this and looking closely at what God's word teaches about leadership in the church. Um, we, it's important that we get this right. We want to be a church that God has called us to be. And I can tell you this because I've experienced this and I know you have too, whether it's on a sports team, in your place of business, or in the church, that when one part of the organization, when one part of the body is not doing its job, the entire body suffers. If we have one part of the team that has been sidelined, the entire body suffers. If this is an area where we need course correction as a church, then by God's grace, we're going to be obedient to his word. We're going to do so prayerfully. We're going to do so as leaders in the church. Our elders and our deacons are going to be praying about this together. Um, I fully understand that even in this room, there's probably different opinions. You probably hold one of those three, and that's, that's okay. We can love each other, and we can serve together, and we can seek uh, God's will through his word, and hopefully to uh, align with one another in the way that we think and the way that we live as we live by God's counsel and his word. So today I want to end our time, uh, just like we did last week, by praying for the deacons in our church, uh, the deacons, as my wife calls them. <laughs> These are very special people that we love and that it's a privilege to serve alongside. Uh, many of them do the work that it happens behind the scenes. You don't even ever see it happen, but it gets done. So we want to pray for them today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today we want to pray for our deacons. We thank you for how you've used these faithful servants over the years uh, here at OCC, in our community, and around the world. We pray that you would give them wisdom as they serve and lead various ministries, that you would give them patience as they learn to build teams and equip others to be kingdom workers. Help them lead with compassion and love as they imitate Jesus in all they do. Give them your strength, your endurance as they serve the church. Help us achieve the mission that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us, if you're able. Don't
son to make a wretch his treasure. Great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to shoulders ashamed to hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me His wounds have paid my ransom. You may be seated. Well, good morning, OCC family. Communion. It's not a message about what we need to do, but what has been done for us. It's not a message about our ability to solve our problems, but God's ability and kindness to solve them. Whatever burden, whatever sin, or any weight that's on your shoulders that you have today, give it to God. Because God will take care of us. I like to read Matthew 11, 28 to 30. And Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are trying in heartbreak, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you from me, for I am gentle and humble in my heart, and you will find rest in your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So take, take time to give God your your sorrows, your troubles, your frustrations. Take the time that you need. And when you're ready, partake in the cup and the bread located in the back of the church. 
Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we bow down before you in humility and ask you to examine our hearts today. Reveal any secret pride, any unconfessed sin or unforgiveness that we may be hindering our relationship with you. As we take the bread and drink the cup representing your body and blood, we can be free of the power and penalty of sin. So thank you for your victory over death. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Onalaska Church of Christ. 
My name is Nathalie. And I'm Jonathan. If this is your first time visiting OCC, please visit the New Here section on our website or fill out a Connect card to get connected with a pastor or elder. These are your OCC weekly announcements. VBS starts this evening with our annual VBS Carnival happening Friday night. This year's theme is Rocky Railway, Jesus' Power Pulls Us Through. You can register your child today when you arrive. VBS starts tonight at 6.15. We want to thank our church family for your continued generosity. If you're led to give, we offer three ways that you can do so. Securely online at gotooocc.org by clicking on Give. Text to Give, texting the word GIVE to 608-291-9514 and in person in the donation box in the sanctuary. Your generosity is what helps us achieve our mission of making more and better disciples. A new round of online and in-person growth groups will begin the week of September 6th through 12th. We will offer a handful of groups that will be meeting throughout the week. For more information about our growth groups or to sign up for a group, please contact the church office. More information and details about the groups will be shared in the coming weeks. Our Sunday morning services is now live online each week through multiple social media platforms. Our services are also recorded and are available to watch anytime the following week. Tell your family, friends, and neighbors to check out our website, Facebook page, or YouTube channel if they don't already have a church home. Remember, if you are traveling over the summer, you can still worship with your church family wherever you go. Happy birthday this week to Joe Osinde and Angie LaFay. Have an amazing week. To keep up to date with everything happening at OCC, you can follow us online through Facebook, Instagram, and our church website. You can also email the church to get added to our email chain if you aren't part of it already. That's it for your OCC weekly announcements. We'll see you next week. Well, it's been great seeing you this morning and worshiping with you today in person and for everyone who's joining us online. Um, as you know, VBS is tonight. Um, if you are able and willing, uh, both of those words together, um, we ask that you stay after for just a few minutes and help us stack the chairs. Um, we're going to stack them in, I believe, rows of seven, uh, seven high. We have to be careful because the racks underneath do come out. But if you are able to do that and willing to do that, we'd appreciate the help. Um, next week, we're going to wrap up our series, Biblical Church Leadership, by talking about uh, church members, the men, women, and children who love Jesus and use their gifts to serve God in and through the local church. Uh, they help move forward the mission and ministry of our church. So I'm excited about that. Um, we'll see you tonight or next week or sometime throughout the week. Go in God's grace and peace. <laughs>